vision of the of the course. So, so today I'll finish the VGIT discussion. I'll discuss the numerical criterion briefly. I'll discuss the construction of MG par briefly, and uh, tomorrow, tomorrow is what I will call freestyle. So, what does it mean? Uh, I mean. I'm by no means a uh, GIT expert, so, so what I do is try to construct and compactify modulized spaces. GIT is one of the tools, and um, I want to give a broader perspective. So, so unfortunately, I didn't finish, uh, for instance, I, uh, I will skip uh, Luna Slice theorem and stuff like that, but I still insist on having like, the last lecture to be hopefully more inspiring <laughs> for you. So what I, hopefully you've learned something in those four lectures, and for this reason I will have also a tutorial, so to question and answer session, basically after, after this. And, uh, and tomorrow I want to, to give kind of a broader perspective, kind of the role played by GIT and how things fit together. Okay, so. Let's continue with VGIT. So basically the point is that VGIT is a paradigm shift <coughs> in moduli. It is hard to believe that it only happened in the 90s. So this is of same order of magnitude. as the fundamental paper, the Lind Manford in 69. So let me just briefly mention kind of, I will, I will not back up uh, this statement by, by examples, but next week I think Emmanuel you'll see this kind of principle of variation over and over again. So let me just say it here and hopefully Emmanuel will do. So before kind of starting with the Lind Manford and stuff, so the goal in moduli was to construct a compact geometric moduli. So this is the main example is the Delin Mumford 69. But after this And I mean, so the kind of other, let's say, non-geometric non compactifications were regarded as exotic and a nuisance. So before starting basically to, with 69, the goal, the holy grail was to construct uh, MG bar, uh, I mean, something analog to MG bar, and, uh, and people realize that actually even for curves you have some other compactifications, but those were regarded as bad, something like uh, pathologicals or something. So after this, people realize that is actually, actually more models is actually good, excellent. So the more models you have, the better. And basically the VGIT philosophy, VGIT philosophy is that you have a simple compactification that you understand and then at the other extreme you have, uh, you have a geometric compactification or something, this is what you want to understand. So like an example, like an example here fitting here, let me do some propaganda being also in, in uh, not, uh, yeah, so this is what you understand and what you want to understand. <laughs> so, you, so, so let me give a concrete example. This is not the best example, but this is kind of fitting with what we did here. So, 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 and let me do propaganda here 
to Patricio. So this is the quintic surfaces. Quintic surfaces. So these are surfaces of general type with PG equals four uh, Q zero K square equals uh, five. So these are surfaces of general type with small invariants. And here one has the KSBA compactification. This is by color, and I will discuss next time more. So by color, this is uh, like complete analog of MG bar. But basically, this is nobody has basically no idea about this one. <coughs> this is basically a black box. So for MG bar, we know everything perfectly. But for surfaces, even low, uh, low things, we don't understand anything. So basically, here you have kind of the thing that you kind of understand is GIT for quintic surfaces. And basically, in some sense, the DGIT tells us there is kind of a series of simple birational transformations changing A into B. So, and this is kind of a real kind of paradigm shift. So, for instance, you want to understand the KSBA for quintic surfaces. It doesn't matter what it is. You just have to think it's a black box which is analog to MG bar. You have a model that you understand, this is the quintic surfaces, and VGIT, I mean, in this situation, unfortunately, we don't have a VGIT story, but VGIT kind of tells you, you should understand this in small steps, small birational modification, moving one, one example to the other. Okay, so let's see, let's see kind of the final results of VGIT is, So in VGIT, kind of the flips are very easy. That's kind of the key point. And let me basically explain. So let's see. This is the picture as before. So this is like the chamber decomposition. You have an L plus. You have an L0 and an L minus, and you move your wall cross. So you do a wall crossing. So basically, what's happening is that the key to understand, to understand the wall crossing is the set Z, which is the set of semi stable points that live at L0 but do not live in the nearby chambers. <coughs> so I explained last time that the semi-stable points at zero is larger than either of those, and the stable is kind of the opposite. So these are kind of the new, and maybe modology. So these are the new orbits that became that are created at L0. And uh, then this would be the center of the birational transformation at L0. So you are looking at the orbits that are created. So these are the new orbits that, that become semi-stable and, 
So think about kind of, we have a simple example. Think about the example, I don't know, this is kind of, maybe you can even produce it, but. So think about the example where we have C star and C star acts on it uh, by, by weights one, one, and then say, suppose that X star at L plus is C square minus zero. Now this is, this is kind of, I think you can create, so this is included in that. And remember what was the picture that we have this type of things. Uh, and, uh, and the quotient in the first case, so the quotient at zero in this situation is just a point, while the quotient of L plus in this situation, it would be just P1. You see, so the, uh, in the first case, you have many closed orbit. So, so if, you, if you exclude the origin, everything becomes closed orbit and you get P1. If you include the origin, the origin will eat all the other orbits and the quotient becomes just, just, uh, ju just a point. And in this situation, this point would be kind of Z and this would be what I will call E plus. So E plus is something like the set of stable points at L plus minus the set of stable points at L zero mod G. And similarly, E minus. So basically, when you have X plus mod, uh, uh, okay, X L plus, mod G goes to X L zero mod G and similarly on the other side, let's not write it. You'll have E plus here going to Z going to here. And this is kind of the exceptional divisor and this is the center of the birational transformation. maybe the exceptional locus or whatever it's called. So the center of the birational transformation is given by the new orbits that are created. The exceptional locus is given by the things that cease to be, semi st uh, cease to be stable as you move from L plus to L minus. And the key example is this one. Do, do you all see this example? So you have this kind of picture with a, with a hole. So this is L plus, everything stable here. And you get P1. And then if you include the origin, the, this becomes just a point because origin is is eating everything else. And of course you can imagine that this is, there is much more kind of, which remains unchanged. <coughs> so the following theorem gives the typical behavior. So the, the following theorem gives the typical behavior. So let's, let us, X be smooth, Z as before. And let's assume for all Z in Z, Z is G of X, uh, corresponds to G of X, a closed orbit. So remember, the points in a GIT quotient always corresponds to closed orbit. So this is a closed orbit in X as at L zero minus excess at L plus union L minus. So you have a closed orbit such that GX is C star. So this is basically the generic assumption. So this is kind of the gen generic behavior. And then the statement is then over a neighborhood of Z 
in z e plus minus over z so e plus and d minus are vibrations locally trivial in the etal topology with fibers weighted projective spaces of complementary dimension I mean so like d plus plus d minus is d minus one So the hypothesis is you take x, uh, I mean notations as before, so you have like L plus, L minus, and L zero as before, and Z is the center that I explained. So up, so, so far the only assumption is that you have smoothness here, which is whatever, uh, some, something that you would expect. So th the quotient that, that you take is a smooth space. So we are taking spa a quotient. And the key assumption, the only assumption is that the stabilizer, so each point in Z corresponds to a closed orbit upstairs. So the stabilizer of that closed orbit, so you have Z is in uh, the quotient here, and then you are taking X upstairs, I'm taking a point Z here, and this corresponds to GX closed orbit upstairs. And the assumption is that the stabilizer, this is a stabilizer, is C star. That's the only assumption. But this is not a strong assumption. This is what generically happens. So if you take kind of like you are not, I mean, wha what I mean by generic, I mean, of course, you can have m three chambers coming together. Of course, if you pass through this, this kind of point, it will be something else. But generically when you cross the wall simply this is what will happen and what's the conclusion is that you have the two di exceptional divisors will be weighted projective vibrations over this uh, this base locus in general you can only say in the et al topology it's not the risky local but only in the et al topology and this, for instance, an application of these kind of things are all kind of Kir1 and whatever. So for instance, you can compute cohomology of the desired space. I mean, so what's happening is typically, I mean, I, I cannot come with an example right now. But anyway, let me just explain. So in many situations you have whatever, so you have this kind of chamber decomposition, stuff like that. And you have, this is a space that you understand. And then you kind of cross generically, you, 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 you arrive to the space that you, uh, that you want. And basically this means that you start with a space, then you do up and down, up and down, so flips, and then you, so this is the start, which is simple. In some situation, many situations might be even the projective space. And then you arrive to the target space, which is complicated. But because these are very simple, kind of the simplest type of topological operations, so you can compute, for instance, Betty numbers or stuff like that. That's the typical, the typical thing that's happening. Okay, let me let me give an example. I mean, let let me finish the example from next uh, from last time, just to see <laughs> concretely what's happening. So let's recall the example last time. I have a moduli of pairs which was. C comma L, so this C is a cubic, 
L is a line. And this is P9 times P2 dual modulo SL3. Now, because peak of Pn cross P2 is this square, as I explained last time, you actually get P of t, which is P9 cross P2 dual t SL3, where t I call the slope of the linearization. In other words, it corresponds to O of 1 t on Pn cross P2 dual. OK. And I explained last time that C, G of X in this situation is the interval 0, 3 halves. So open at 0 and uh, close at 3 halves, which is included in the interval. So this is the T expression, which is included in the interval 0, infinity, which is the ample corner. So you see here that's strictly included. These are the slope for which you have any kind of invariant. Actually, you can extend, you can close it up. And I explained last time, or I sketched something. So P of 0, so you can extend it at 0. So 0, this is only semi-ample. What does it mean? Because you have Pn cross P2 and you are taking the polarization 1, 0, you are simply projecting to P9. So this is easy to see that this is just M bar. This is GIT for plane cubics. And I also said last time that you get this chamber decomposition. So this is 0, 3 fifths, 1, and 3 halves. And geometrically, what will happen? So remember that we are looking at P of t, which is moduli of pairs C, C comma L. So as you increase t, so this is t increasing, C is allow more singular. C is more singular. And here is actually kind of easy. So here is A1, A2, A3, and D4. So this is the node. You allow, at this point, you allow C to become a node. Here you allow C to acquire a cusp. Here to become a tack node. And here you allow C to become the D4, which in this situation is three lines passing through a point. In the opposite direction is you, something has to give. So L, in the opposite direction, L intersects C becomes more transversal. So as I increase T, C becomes more singular and L intersected C becomes more transversal. So what does it mean? Here is L not passes, not, does not pass through singularity. Here L is not tangent, uh, not inflectional. Here L is not tangent. And, and I think that's all. So you see, as I increase, first I'm not allowing L to pass for a singularity. At the next step, I'm, uh, I'm not allowing L to become, uh, to be inflectional, and so on and so forth. OK, so so what I get is the following thing. So I'm getting P of 0, P of epsilon, P of uh, 3 fifths, P of 3 fifths plus epsilon, P of 1. And actually, this is an isomorphism. 
this becomes p of 1 plus epsilon, and this is collapsing to p of 3 halves. This one, as I said, this is just m bar, this is just p1. And at the other extreme, this is just a point. And actually, kind of this for uh, this maps here, this is CL, this is for getting C. And at the other extreme, I have CL, I'm forgetting C, I'm just remembering the intersection. But the intersection here is just three points, so there is no moduli, the quotient will be a moduli. So this one, as I said, and I will not explain, so this is just a divisorial contraction. And here, this is actually a VGLT flip. And let me s explain what's happening here, and then we can move on. So this is a general picture that you get from VGLT. You go up and down, up and down, and as I say, once I establish this chamber decomposition, you see that I'm writing something like, Three fifths plus epsilon. This is the same thing as p of one minus epsilon, or whatever number I want in that interval. Because in this interval, nothing changes. So, so here nothing changes. And stuff. The dimensions of these three so, 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 so you see. So this is three dimensional. This is so everything in the middle is three dimensional, and the endpoints at one point is one dimensional and the other point is, uh, so we in this simple example, you basically see all the minimal model program. You see all the, all the transformations in a s the simplest possible example. And actually there is a deep, and maybe I can um, discuss uh, during the tutorial, there is a deep connection between like Mori dream spaces and stuff like this. Anyway, so let's see what's happening. I have to explain, so explain the change at t equals 3 fifths. Because that's kind of the interesting one. So basically, let's see. By my diagram there, I have before 3 fifths, let's see, c is only nodal. And basically, L is any, any line not uh, through the singularity. After 3 fifths, C is uh, allowed, and everything is stable. So here, everything is stable. So this is really a, a geometric quotient. There is nothing funny going on. <coughs> Similarly, after 3 fifth, C is allowed nodes and cusps. But L is not allowed to be inflectional. So if you just see the difference, the difference, uh, the, the difference between those two, it means kind of clearly the thing that changes. So these are things that are stable before three fifths, and cease to be stable at three fifths. These are simply curves, cubics plus an inflectional line. So the, the things that are replaced are, I mean, generically, the cubic could be smooth. It can be nodal, but so this is the locus that's replaced. And it turns out that this is actually isomorphic to P1. Actually, to be more correct, is a weighted P1. And maybe you can see why is that. Anyway, on the other hand, uh, E minus, similarly, these are simply, so these are things that become, become stable after three, fi uh, three fifths. Okay, I have it wrong. So this should be minus and plus if I take <laughs> three fifths as, so, <laughs> so before three fifths and after. So what are things that uh, whatever, 
are stable at three f after three fifths and not before. I mean, we have it on the diagram and stuff like that. These are cuspidal cubics plus basically any line. Now there is some sort of condition on the line and stuff like that. This is again isomorphic with P1. So you can just write the normal equation and you'll see that this is the case and whatever. So of course there is something to be proved. So, and they will map to Z. the center of the thing, which in this situation has to be a point because, I don't know, just by dimension reasons. So you have a three-dimensional space. I just, uh, I just said that you get P1 on one side and the other one you have a flip. The, the, the base locus is a point. What is that point? I don't know. I, I will give you a price. <laughs> so, so these are things that become semi-stable, semi-stable uh, exactly at this point. So they, they are just a flash in the pan. So they, they only exist at that point. So everything that you need to know is on the blackboard. It's just logic at this point. This is actually the, oh, okay, I'm running short of time. This is the cubic plus line such that the cubic is, is, has a cusp and the line is inflectional. Because you see that's kind of the, I mean, just by whatever. So it actually, this is explicitly written in equation. This is, we know this one. Uh, okay, y squared z equals x cubed and the line is Z. So this is just the standard cubic, uh, the standard cuspidal cubic, and the line at infinity is actually inflectional. So you see, uh, these are cubics with inflectional line. This is like the E plus, and these are uh, cubics with A2. And this is the overlap, which is basically this, what I wrote there, X cube Y square Z and z. So if I remove this common thing, then everything becomes stable at 3 fifths minus epsilon. This is stable at 3 fifths plus epsilon. So in the middle, this is only at 3 fifths. And this leads to collapsing of orbits. and so on. Is the picture clear? So you see, so at zero, I mean, the semi, the, the semi stability is uh, semi continuous. So, so, so you jump up. So you, so if something is semi stable slightly before, it will be also semi stable when you go to, to zero. So when you acquire more kind of everything becomes semi stable at once and everything collapses, so you have this picture. You have the usual picture of the flip. Okay, if this is, if this example is clear, then. Well, this, this is not clear to me, the geometry of the, <coughs> of the flip. So, the first uh, three for this uh, compacted bundle, right? Yeah. Over six to one. Yeah. I mean, it's a bit uh, misleading because it's kind of whatever. So, that, uh, I mean, there will be all, always some sort of like finite stabilizers, right. and so, so, so that's. Right. But morally, this yeah. Is and then this E plus, right? This is uh, something which is transversal. 
Yeah. The, the could you, could you yeah. Could you lose money, right? Y yeah. So uh, three, if this is constructed. Yeah. To, to that point. point so this uh, three fifths, this becomes a lead <coughs> Yeah, I, I mean, the, I think here is essentially, and I mean, uh, here is essentially the exam, uh, I mean, this is exam, I mean, let me, okay, so this is basically the example of Mukai, so maybe I'll discuss, let me st put it here, so this is, actually what's happening is like the Mukai flop, or I don't know. <laughs> I mean, in, in dimension three is the standard, this is the standard resolution of the double point of the threefold ordinary double point. So this means that you are getting the cone over the quadric in whatever, in three dimensions, uh, the quadric is two-dimensional, the cone is three-dimensional, then you have two small resolutions. So you have the two small, this is the flip, or flop actually, so this is the, the, the standard two resolutions. And this example, let me write, so this is exactly locally what's happening here. And let me put it uh, explicitly, so this is example. So this example is given by the following. You take x to be c4, you take g to be c star, and uh, g acts on x by weights one, one, minus one, minus one. So you are taking the quotient, I mean this is the local model of what I explained. So you are taking the quotient, I mean you can see, so x mod g, this is uh, spec of the ring of invariance, spec of c. What's the ring of invariance here? Is something like x1, x3, x1, x4, x2, x2, uh, x3, x2, x4. Which is the same thing if I relabel y1, y2, y3, y4. This is the same thing as spec of c, y1, and so on, modulo y1, y, uh, okay, y1, y4, Okay, hopefully I got it right. So this is the cone, the, the, the cone over the quadric. Now this is kind of, uh, you, you say, oh well, that's, that's the cone. How do I get a flip and how do I do variation of GAT here? I need to, a line bundle to linearize. In this situation, I only have a line bundle, which is the, the O of X. The, I mean, we are in the affine space. This is not exactly what I had, but kind of you can do it also in this situation. But you have choice of linearization. Choice of linearization. What is choice of linearization? Remember that in this situation, your, your group is a torus. So basically you have a character, character of G, which in this situation is just one dimensional. So basically the character of G is just t or t inverse. Let's call this one plus and the other one minus. Then you can check or whatever, so you can check that x with respect to this linearization of g maps to the other one. This is just the zero character if you want, this is the affine quotient and the other one, G. This is the, s the two small resolutions of the quadricon. 
And let me just, what is this one? This is the proj of the ring of semi-invariants, so Rg psi plus, these are semi-invariants, uh, where semi-invariant means that I have a polynomial, I'm acting by G, and instead of taking that, I'm taking the character to some power times F. This is actually exactly the same thing that, 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 I, uh, that I did in the projective quotient case, if, if you unwind it. Because what, the, what does it mean? So what does it mean choice of linearization? It means that I'm taking the cone over this one. So basically, when I do the choice of linearization, it means that I'm putting it in C5, and I'm choosing the lift, the lift on C5. And Sorry? Uh, K, some K for some K. Because this would be graded. So you see K gives the grading. This is exactly the same thing. I mean, it doesn't look the same, but it's exactly the same thing that I explained in the projective quotient case. And here you can compute it. And if I would have time, maybe I will explain it uh, during the, the office, uh, uh, the whatever, <laughs> the <laughs> tutorial, the Luna slice theorem. You actually exactly this is the picture, the local picture uh, in my situation. In that situation, it will be slightly different. It will not be 1, 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1. It will be something like 3, 4, 2, minus. Uh, I mean, it will be the same thing, two pluses and two minuses, but it will not be like 1, 1, 1. It will be some sort of also some sort of finite thing going on. But this is the, the local picture. And here you can compute. So. I mean, okay, this is really an exercise to see, first of all, to see what is this ring of semi-invariants. So you are allowing to transform here, and I mean, maybe we'll discuss this example, and then what's the approach. And then you'll see that it's, it's exactly what I said, the two small resolutions. F is polynomial of any degree. So we are saying it has to be semi-invariant, uh, semi-invariant. Maybe it has to be of degree k or minus k or something. So anyway, this, this lift destroys the capsule of yeah. projective bound, yeah. right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I mean this, okay, uh, I will explain for people in the, so I did this moduli of pairs for some reason, so we, so we just go to, to see my thesis. And I, of course, I didn't do it, I didn't do it for, uh, for cubic curves, I did it for quintic curves, because that's, that's uh, what interested me, some deformation theory uh, related to work of Pinkham and so on, so and I'll, I don't want to get into that. So, 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 so exactly there, this kind of VJT principle was kind of whatever, why I got the PhD. So, 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 so basically, basically there was a space that was related to K-freeze that I understood well, and there was a deformation space that I wanted to, to understand. And following the flips, I could relate one, f one to the other. That's kind of the, the point. Okay. I don't know. I'm not doing a good job explaining GIT if I'm not doing the numerical criteria. So, so. so it is very hard to determine stability, semi-stability. So the main tool for this is the numerical criteria. I will state the numerical criterion and whatever, I will give an example and continue in the tutorial for people interested. But let me explain what's the idea. So semi-stable and stuff, if you remember when we had a discussion, is basically related to closed orbits. Closed orbits 
is very related to properness. Now, how do I test the properness of something is by using the valuative criterion of properness. And kind of what is specific for GIP setup, specific for GIP setup, is the fact that I can reduce to families given by one parameter subgroups. So remember, how do I test uh, the, the, the properness? I'm taking whatever things over the puncture disk. I'm looking what's happening when I'm filling in the puncture disk and so on. But now kind of the statement is that to test properness in the GAT setup, I can, I can, uh, so I can reduce, can reduce to study things like lambda t dot uh, dot x. So I have the setup is x is projective, g acts here, and I also have a line bundle which is g linearized. This is my setup. And I'm taking a point x in x, and lambda t is an algebraic group morphism from C star into G. So this is an algebraic group morphism. This is what I would call one parameter subgroup. So remember kind of the point is that in the, in, in general I would have to do something like this. I would consider and the question would be about filling in here. But the GIT thing tells me that I can consider families which are given basically x0 times lambda t over c star, and then fill it in to see. But now let's see what's happening. I need to take the limit t goes to 0 of lambda t times x. Now keep in mind that I'm in the projective space. So this limit always has to exist. The projective, uh, I, I mean, x, x is projective, so uh, is proper, so this limit always exists. So now this means I can fill it in, but this x0 is fixed by C star induced by lambda. So this is the limit and it's obviously that you get some sort of family. All the fibers are the same, only the central fiber. So this is xt, which are just translation of the same thing of x. And this is the singular fiber where I have a C star action. And here is the choice of linearization coming into play. Because x0 in x is uh, c star fixed, then this c star acts on lx0. This is the fiber over, over l, uh, over x0 of l. This is, of course, c. So remember that I have the space and I have a group action upstairs. If the point is fixed, because I lifted the, the section upstairs, I have a, s and now C star acts there by a weight. So basically my definition is mu x, mu x lambda is actually, is actually minus, the weight of the C star action on, on C, which is L of X0. And the minus is just uh, Mumford's convention to, to state. And of course, it depends on L, depends on L, 
but here we can ignore. You can read, you can read in my, my survey what's happening if you're very ill and stuff like that. So the numerical criterion, Hilder Manford, is that x in x is semi-stable, is equivalent that for all lambda mu of xn is greater equal to zero. This is the minus, why you want the minus, because you want to, to look positive, is stable if and only if for all lambda mu of x lambda is strictly larger than zero. Okay, so first is a definition which kind of takes a while to digest, but then the criterion is very simple. Now, of course, it's kind of totally unclear why this would be a good criterion and stuff. So let's see an example. Let's see like n unordered points in, in uh, P1. So basically I'm taking the quotient P of sim n v modulo. There is no choice of linearization in this situation. This is just uh, modulo SL2 where v is the standard representation, dual or something. Okay, so so SL two is rank one. So basically, up to conjugation. Lambda t is just t t inverse zero or some power of it. So any one parameter subgroup after conjugating is of this type. Now x, okay, I should write f for x because I'm just taking something in the symmetric, this one. So this is just, I don't know, if you want, C of x, y in degree n. What is the action? So like lambda t times f, it's obvious what's the action. So this is, uh, I don't know, t to the n, x to the n, t to n minus 2, x to the n minus two y, eh, minus one y, and so on, plus t to the minus n y to the n. And of course, I have coefficients here. <coughs> so I have a polynomial. I'm acting as simple as possible. And let's call them somehow. So let's call the coefficients c C0 up to Cn. In this situation, it turns out that mu of uh, f and lambda, it is just minus uh, minus uh, minus something like I know, I guess, n minus k, uh, n minus 2k, where k is the uh, largest such that, such that uh, ck is different from 0. So basically the weight, so the weight 
will be the, this weight corresponding to the first t n minus 2k to the first case where you have ck different from zero. Okay? So what does it mean? And I mean, you see, it's kind of funny because I have minus n, it becomes positive. So when do I have unstable? This less than zero. It means that my polynomial f is in fact only xn plus those, those dots up to xn over 2. Okay, I don't know. So this should be plus 1 <laughs> yn over 2 minus 1. And you have to put whatever the brackets, how we, how we should. So my polynomial stops in the middle, or basically stops in the middle. So I, I show that if something is unstable, then I have this property that my polynomial stops in the middle. What does it mean? It means that it has a root of multiplicity larger than n over 2. So conclusion is that x, uh, okay, n points in P1 are semi-stable if and only if no root has multiplicity greater than n over 2 no, whatever, no point has multiplicity greater than 2. And similarly, stable if you, it is greater n equals over 2. And you can s even say more if no root, okay, stable is clear. The, the only poly stable, but not stable orbit. is when you have n over 2, n over 2 multiplicities. So if you have something with multiplicity n over 2, it distributes in this way. It <coughs> but keep in mind, and uh, I'll discuss uh, more in, the, in that, that actually what I proved, what I proved is that if a point Basically, what I proved here is, uh, is a point is unstable if and only if it has a multiplicity larger than n over 2. What I can prove are facts about unstable points. Of course, if I understand unstable points, I can turn it out into semi-stable points. But what I prove, and we'll do more examples in the tutorial, is I prove something about unstable points and then deduce things about stable points. And let me just, okay, any question? Or <laughs> let me just put one more example, kind of plain curves. Sorry? Yeah. Semi-stable, yeah, be, be, be because this is, I mean, this is exactly the same thing because I, I put a no here. So if so, so, so unstable is, yeah, yeah. if I would say less, it would have been less equal and over two. So le let's briefly discuss about plane curves. So basically in this situation, lambda, so SL3 has rank two, which means that lambda can be assumed to be of type T A B T B C A T T C with A plus B plus C equal to zero. As before, I'm acting lambda T, I'm acting on polynomials F, which are things like X 
to I0, Y to I1, and Z to, to I2. And of course, what I'll have, I'll have things of type TA times I0 plus uh, B times I1 plus C times I2. And of course, I have two conditions. So I have ABC is 0. I have I0, I1 plus I2 equals D, the degree. But now kind of whatever the, <laughs> the nice thing here is that I can arrange things arrange the monomials in a triangle, in a pyramid, in a triangle. So I can put the monomials like this. So this would be x to the d, y to the d, z to the d, and uh, something like X, square, uh, x to the d minus 1, y, and you get the picture. And now I can represent, so these are the monomials, and I can represent lambda as a line. Okay, you have to think a bit. The monomials are, are uh, I think you can interpret them as characters of the representation why lambda lives in the dual space, so it defines a linear space, so lambda is, uh, so the monomials are characters, lambda is a one parameter subgroup, these are naturally dual, so this, I, I mean, this is not just a picture kind of random, so, so this is a line through the center. And I'm indicating either full or zero, so this is the coefficient non-zero, or zero coefficient. And basically semi-stable semi-stable is equivalent to saying no line through the origin, through the center leaves all points on one side. strictly on one side. And stable would be, I renounce to st stable. So basically, unstable means something like this. So zero here, anything here. So this is the picture of, and here there is always a center of the triangle. This is unstable. Okay, so I represent the monomials, and if you, if you unwind what it means. And let's uh, finish here, just noting maybe a theorem is that if x is smooth, then, uh, then x is actually stable. And the proof is Assume not, there exists lambda one parameter subgroup such that the diagram looks like this. Zero upstairs and whatever. Here I don't care. I mean the difference between stable and unstable is that I allow things on the line. And now if you pay the attention, you see that this one Actually, you see that these things always have to be zero, always have to be zero, which means that x to the d, x to d minus one y, and x d minus one z vanish, which is exactly the condition of singularity. So I'm taking any line I'm taking, you'll see, actually I might lie, lie a bit because, anyway, you'll see that any line that I'm taking through the center, it always have to leave, starting with degree three, it always have to leave the top corner 
to be zero because I have only on one side. So one, one of the three corners will be completely zero, which means exactly that the coefficients of these monomials vanish, which means exactly the singularity condition. Okay, and let me stop here. <laughs>